I guess the first thing to say is sort of, ladies and gentlemen, but also to my wonderful and colourful Dutch colleagues, Darmish in Heron. Did I get that right? Along those lines. This is true, right? We all experience the same problems, and nothing has changed, of course. We have a big problem, of course. Two-thirds of the population, as highlighted by the Global Commission a year ago, said that they don't have access to safe and affordable surgery. We're talking about basic requirements, appendicectomies, cesarean sections, and management of orthopedic fractures, which will save lives and certainly save morbidity around the grand scheme of things. Huge variation, of course, in resource, in implementation, and of course, surgical practice. I was inspired yesterday when Ralph Simon um, curated a session on global health by the team from Village Health in Burundi, who highlighted this problem and dealing with the problems in some way. So we have a problem, we've quantified the problem, how do we manage it? We need to disrupt, we need to democratize surgical education to provide the two million extra surgeons required around the world to make it fair and equitable, uh, but also to perform 150 million extra operations per year around the globe. How do we do that? And that's the problem. I think we will have a moral obligation to somehow provide a solution or two to that problem. We've all seen this picture before, of course, Biroff back in 1870, uh, holding center stage in the operating theatre, of course. And theatre resonates because it's a theatre. We call it theatre rather than operating room, because that's where the action happened, of course. Huge amount of people watching over people's shoulders, trying to get a view into the operating field. That we haven't changed for hundreds of years. We've accepted this dogma and this tradition. This is my own hospital, the Royal London. Look at that, 1920, huge amount of people around operating theatre, Hard to think how anybody's going to get trained in that environment, but yet, we accept it. We don't challenge it, we carry endlessly perpetuating the myth that we can train people better in this fashion. A year ago, I asked the question, we've got to change things, we're stuck, we don't move on, we're happy with our lives and surgery, and we do the same things over and over again, because our forefathers taught us we will carry on doing the same thing again. So challenging dogma tradition has to be part of all of our uh, mantra in designing new ways of teaching. The world has changed, of course, and this is the key. It's connected. And that connection is the key for us to scale up education, to provide the solution to the global problem. The companies are helping us. So Google, as I'm sure you realize, Project Loon, are putting balloons into the cloud, giving people high-speed Wi-Fi access to parts of the globe that need it. Facebook, not to be undone by Google, are launching Project Aquila, a drone that will fly at 60,000 feet across the globe and work on giving out, again, high-speed access to remote parts of the world. Mark Zuckerberg went to Africa recently for those very reasons. How do you connect people? So they're helping us design the future. And we, as clinicians and surgeons, have to work out a way of managing that for ourselves. Facebook have put their money in virtual reality. Big time, Oculus Swift, they bought it out for $2.1 billion from a chap called Palmer Lucky a few years ago. And in fact, they're putting cable down called Project Maria with Microsoft from North America to Europe because they know that's the future. They've got to connect people better and you need much higher bandwidth than is possible at the moment. <clears throat> so you have the biggest companies in the world wanting to help us go forward. And it'd be a shame if we couldn't use that to our advantage. Let's go back two years. About two years ago, May 2014, I used the Google Glass, I'm sure some of you have seen the story about it, to use a simple technique, a wearable technology, <clears throat> which could stream live to the world, to train people in a different manner. Normally, it's a one-to-one, -one, or one-to-two teaching or training. What about one-to-many? One-to-many is the key. You've got to scale up. If we need a lot of surgeons in the future, we have to empower them and train them, but in a different modality. So I used Google Glass, we created an app, the students around the world and trainees could access the app and actually text message on their mobile phone, which would appear on my glass as I was training them. You could teach people from every part of the globe. That one experiment allowed me to teach 14,000 people in one day. Okay? Not one or two. This is what we have to think about, it's scaling up big time. 
We have the power, and it, you know, they liked it, they enjoyed it. You're connecting people. Look at that in the bottom right-hand corner. Australia, you think it's a first world country. 5,000 would tune in, because they feel more part of the world that we live in, they're more connected. So suddenly you're embracing the whole of mankind in a different way, just by a simple idea about wearable tech connections. And Daniel Kraft and John Loss and I went to Dubai about, two, about a year and a half ago at a great conference. And in fact, I managed to train this man who's called John Scully, the CEO of Apple, who sacked Steve Jobs, to do a remote operation using wearable tech. So even he understood the principles of getting out to the market, and obviously he had a phone company that was going to be accessible going forward. So it's people that understand this global problem and how to deal with it. So about a month ago, my team at Virtual Medics have launched a global medical school platform to be able to teach anyone around the world for free, accessing the best people around the world to teach them because of wearable technology and connections. And we all, I want you all to be part of that community to come and help us. <coughs> we want people to be trained by the very best around the world so you can all engage and offer that free service to everyone that needs it. We shouldn't be restrained by geography or resources. That's really part of the key message that I'm giving you today. Let's go back, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to imagine something for me. Now imagine that you're a surgical trainee in Tanzania. You're restrained by geography, you're in a rural setting, but you want some training, you want to improve the standards of your healthcare system, as every doctor does. You want to improve your standards, or at least improve the basic healthcare of a system. Imagine you're a surgeon, maybe an attending in Bangladesh, a population of 150 million, but with a very poor infrastructure of training and teaching. But yet, also you want to improve your standards, like we all have to do. How do you do that? Resources are a problem. Travel, geography, it's a problem. But we can overcome some of these ideas. Imagine your school kid in a inner city area, a, a sort of a poor area, a poor district. But again, you want to be a surgeon, you want to train to be a medic. You want to access that information. You'd like to know what it's like and immerse yourself. You have every right to do that. Education is a basic fundamental right for everybody. Why can't they access that free education around the world? You could be a school teacher who is in a remote area, but he feels, or he, she feels, that their students shouldn't be constrained by their geography. You want the very best for your children, like all school teachers do, of course. And Naveen Jain said earlier, you've got to be a bit crazy to be an entrepreneur. I think I'm off the scale in this regard. Having had the whole world watch my operation two years ago, I invited them again back in April the 14th, 2016, to the world's first virtual reality operation, Recording 360. Things have moved on. AR and VR have evolved, everything's evolved, and now we've got much better solutions to the problem. I persuaded our hospital by itself, the biggest trust in the UK, looking after two million patients, big trust, to part, and we're strapped for cash, we have no money. Yeah, I persuaded them to give me some money, all right, to buy Google Cardboards for everybody. So every staff member had a Google Cardboard. Let's disrupt, let's do something really crazy. The pharmacists, the physios, the um, people working in the basement, the nurses, all had access to live feed. I thought, you know what, let's do something. Let's work out where we're going with the hospital around me. We created an app called VINOR, 
one click on a, on a phone, two clicks to go into VR mode or 360, suddenly you're immersed. Two clicks, that's all it takes for you to access training from anywhere around the world. Isn't that simple? Isn't that great? And a British surgeon turned an operating room into a global virtual reality experience. The idea is to allow medical students and others to stand in the shoes of an experienced surgeon. It's just the start of more technology making its way into the OR to educate others. This camera hovers high above the operating table at the Royal London Hospital, bringing the images of surgery to places far beyond the OR. It's the world's first operation to be streamed live in 360-degree video via a company called Medical Realities. Dr. Shafi Ahmed hopes it'll transform medical training worldwide. Well, I think in, in the past we've done 2D uh, videos, which are readily available. This is going to be 360 immersive. So people around the world using low-cost technology uh, with a Google Cardboard or headset and a smartphone and app can access live operations and training. With students all over the whole world watching, the operation begins. Okay, we're live. The surgery to remove a tumor in the colon may be routine, but for those watching, it's anything but. <laughs> students using VR headsets and smartphones can view in any direction and zoom in on the operating theater. As Dr. Ahmed narrates live, they could even ask questions. I found it really great because I've been in theaters before and it's often really difficult to have um, a good view of what's going on, so often you're pushed to the background and you can't see anything. Dr. Ahmed believes this technology, giving others the experience of what it's really like to be in the OR, is just the beginning. In time, there'll be haptic feedback, you'll be wearing gloves, for example, or body suits. You can touch, feel things in the virtual world. And ultimately, imagine a time where you have a virtual surgeon, where you prop into a virtual theater, you have a virtual patient, virtual instruments, and you do a virtual operation before ever going to operate theater fully. And that learning experience will be vital. It's the, the most immersive simulation that we can think of. The surgery was a success, and now the plan is to create a library of other surgeries shot with a 360-degree view. The patient, a 62-year-old British man, says, while some time, it took some time for him to agree to it, he finally did, knowing the experience would benefit medical students around the world. It went viral. Um, we had 55,000 people watching the operation live, so you could train that many people in 4,000 cities, 5 million people twittering about the whole process in 140 countries. Simple reach from a simple idea. And in fact, the interesting thing is the Chinese phoned us about, uh, about 10 minutes before the feed, and they sent it to 1.2 billion people. We have no idea how many people watched it, because of the hundreds of thousands, because they, it was front page headlines on China national TV. Because they understood a big uh, country, how to access that information, they would use these type of techniques to help train their uh, trainees. And obviously, uh, I'm fortunate Daniel managed to make it to the theater with me and supporting me. And he's been very supportive of my ideas and my vision for the future of surgical education. So I'm really grateful, truly, from the bottom of my heart for your support, Daniel. So it can be that simple. Could it be a free app into a smartphone, into a cardboard box, which would cost literally nothing at all? We have to think about simple solutions, although high tech, but low cost. That's the way you penetrate the market and make healthcare more equitable and fair, right? The company I work with, Medical Realities, we're now developing with a company in the, in the UK a nice haptic feedback, because VR itself needs to adapt, you need to CGI, you need photorealism. You need to have access to um, controls. You need to touch fuel. This glove allows you to touch fuel and add temperature. So with a flick of an iPhone, you can feel an ice cube immediately, or a hot flame. That's what we need to get to, and we're working on the whole idea of haptic feedback in our solution. I have to use the word singularity at some point during this talk, otherwise I won't be here, right? So I, at Wired Health earlier this year, I talked about the future, about surgical robots replacing surgeons, okay? This is really about the future and how things will change in the next 10, 15, 20 years where you'll be actually being operated on by a robot. No question, it's going to happen. It raised huge controversy on Twitter, okay? What's the ethics behind all of this? A week later, the first robot came out that could join two bits about together. Okay, it's happening already. And that operation was done better than a surgeon, less leak, better opposition. It's already happening. AI is coming in. It will change our lives, of course. Now, one of the things key about all of this, which is really important, and we have not had much mention of this during this two, last two or three days, is patients. They're our partners. Okay, we have to take them on that journey with us in innovation. Without them, we're nothing at all. They have to buy into the idea. 
My patients here, this one in the middle, is watching her own operation of virtual reality. Can you believe it? Her cancer operation, her and her husband. The guy on the right, who I did a live VR operation, his family watched the operation live as I was doing it with the rest of the world. We can discuss the ethics of that going forward at lunch break. But this is what we need. We want them to take us forward in this whole process. What about the human side? What about the patients? What about the surgeons? Well, this is great because we're training people, but also the, I run what's called the International Surgical Training Program at the Royal College of Surgeons of England. I've trained 60 surgeons from 25 countries in the last two years. So it's about VR, it's about AI, it's about human, it's about traveling, it's about training. It's the whole gamut that we're offering so that the world becomes a better place and more equitable. That's what we have to do. Now, this is for uh, Lawrence Anous. Okay, and I spoke in on Teeb a few weeks ago. At the end of the lunch, they get some of this stuff. So I'll read out to you: Pour aider un milliard de personnes, nous devons connecter un milliard d'esprits. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. So this is terrific work. It's going to globalize and democratize surgical education. What other layers might you put in there? Let's say the AI piece that can tell you, oh, you're about to yeah. pick the wrong gallbladder, gallbladder clip. Yeah, I think AI is fundamental. It will train you. It will improve your efficiency of movement, etc. All the skills we don't see, like the team working around you, AI can be built into that to make you much better. And we're worried about the technical skills all the time. It's more technical skills. It's about how you behave in a team, how you make judgments. That's where AI interface will be really useful. And what could this community here and online help you with to get this to the next level? I want you to get the information out there. I want you to use our platform. I want people to engage. I want people from all parts of the world to say, okay, let's, let's teach. Let's use your platform for free. Let's just, we can sort out the, the, um, the sort of issue around software and hardware and just teach. Why not? We teach all the time. But why teach one or two people when you can actually make an impact the rest of the world? It makes sense. But yes, you're all part of this. Absolutely. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.